End of watch for the week of the memorial holiday goes to senior airman Roger Fortson, born on April 15, 2001, and growing up the third out of five children in the ATL Metro. Roger was described as a humble, talented, fun-loving, family-oriented young man who looked out for those close to him. In school, he was book smart, getting A's and B's on all of his report cards. And as a boy named after his own father, he aimed to be sharp all around. When he was 13, his mother went into labor with his younger sister, and he rode with her in the ambulance to the hospital, and he tried to tell the doctor how to deliver the baby. He was very protective of his two younger siblings and wanted to be a great role model for both of them. But like many teens, he was unsure of what he wanted to make out of his life. But after scoring exceedingly high on the ASVAB test, he figured he'd give the military a shot. He was attending Ronald McNair High School in DeKalb County, which according to AP News, only has a 50% graduation rate. But Roger would graduate class of 2019 with honors. And in November of that year, he would officially join the Air Force, where he shined even brighter, and his fellow airmen got to know him for his kindness, his tenacity, and his overall ability to become the best of the best of the best. Sir, check it. Roger scored the highest evaluation possible on his first AC-130 eval ride. And according to Captain Malcolm Lee, the evaluator pilot, just before the exam, Roger would reach into the aircraft and hand him a fire extinguisher and tell him, you're going to need this because I'm going to be on fire answering these questions today. <laughs> okay then, okay then. And he joined the 4th Special Operations Squadron, becoming a special missions aviator. And one of his many roles was to load the gunship's cannons during missions. And he had aspirations of eventually becoming a pilot, but at 22, he was already a combat veteran, deploying to Iraq and Syria to conduct special ops missions, and he would be awarded the Air Medal with a Combat Device in 2023. Now typically, an award of this caliber is only given after 20 flights in a combat zone or for conspicuous valor or achievement on a single mission, and an Air Force official confirmed that Roger's award reflected both, and that he took special actions during one of the missions to address an in-flight emergency and allow the mission to continue. And as he ranked up and received more accolades, he was always giving back to his family. While he was away in Kuwait and Qatar, while other service members were getting care packages, he was sending food home to his family and made sure they stayed supplied with all that they would need. And when he was home, he'd take the whole family to Disney World and get his mom a new ride. His nickname was Mr. Make It Happen. <laughs> but back in the States, he'd be based at the Special Ops Wing at Hurlburt Field, which is an airfield in the Florida Panhandle. And at the time, he was living off post at the Elon Apartments in nearby Fort Walton Beach. He would still make frequent trips to ATL to check in on his loved ones. And when he injured himself during an accident on the job and was in excruciating pain to the point that he told his mom he felt like he wanted to die. But he still managed to press on for his younger brother and sister. He knew he had to be there to show them that there is so much more to this life. And when his mother suffered her own accident not long after that and was in the ER, Roger dropped everything and drove the five hours to visit her in the hospital, as that was the kind of man he was. But in being an inspiration to his siblings, he had even bought his young sister a matching aviator's uniform so she can flex with her warrior big brother. And in May of 2024, he had planned to bless her with even more gifts for her 10th birthday, and was also making preparations to buy his mother a house, something he had always dreamed of doing. By this time, his mother couldn't help but be so proud of just how far her son had came and said where we come from, we don't end up where Roger ended up, and just knew he had so many more things to achieve. But on the afternoon of Friday, May 3rd, 2024, cops would be dispatched to the Elon apartments after a cause of a disturbance between a couple. I'm saying that it happens frequently, okay. but this time it sounded like it was getting out of hand. Okay, which door? Um, oh. so I'm not sure, two weeks ago I was walking by, like, by their apartment basically mm -hmm. on this side, and I was hearing someone yell, like, shoot the up, like, stupid B-word and all this other stuff, and it just stopped, like, okay. right after it. But I wasn't sure where it came from, okay. and I couldn't call, like, I didn't want to call the police. And, uh, you know, Which room is it? 1401. 1401, okay. 1401. But the girl sounded scared, the one that called. She said, she was like, it's getting out of, it sounds like it's getting really okay. out of hand. So it's hit number four, huh? Yeah. Okay. Now the lady who called gave cops apartment 1401, saying it was on the fourth floor. The cop would go into the elevator and press the number four. Though when he got off the elevator, it said three for third floor, 
but it did take him to the fourth floor, and he saw what he believed to be the right unit number. Moments later, Roger, who was home alone in apartment 1401 and on a FaceTime call with his girlfriend going over Cinco de Mayo plans for the weekend, would hear a bang on his front door. He responded, who is it? But there was no answer. He then went over to the door and looked through the peephole and didn't see anyone as officers are trained to move out of the way of the front door to avoid possible criminals from shooting at them through the front door. But with Roger being skeptical, he would go to his room and retrieve his legally owned firearm for protection, just in case. Because anyone can bang on your door and claim to be the law and then hide where you can't see them. Sheriff's office, open the door. Roger would open the door and the cop told him, Step out. And then he proceeded to shoot Roger repeatedly at point blank range. Now Roger had his weapon down by his side and his other hand up as a way of signaling peace, but the officer didn't care about that. After firing six rounds, all of which struck Roger in the chest, he then told Roger to drop the weapon, which at this point had flung across the room when he was shot. As the officer repeatedly said, drop the weapon, Roger can be heard on the tape saying, it's over there, I don't have it. Three other deputies arrived moments later and cleared the apartment first. Afterwards, they began to render aid on Roger. The officer who shot him, however, would step out of the apartment and walk down the breezeway. Roger's girlfriend later released the chilling FaceTime call that recorded the audio of the moments after the shooting. On it, Roger can be heard moaning in pain and saying he can't breathe, while responding officers kept telling him don't move. As they called paramedics, they described the scene. They can't breathe. Do not move. Stop moving. We're good. You have a gun since you opened that door. They just said, oh yeah, he shot up. He shot up. My baby was shot up. Roger would be taken to a nearby hospital where he would die from his injuries. He was just 23 years old. His family would be notified of his demise, and immediately, Okaloosa County Sheriff officials said that the officer had acted in self-defense while responding to a call of a disturbance in progress at an apartment complex, and as a result, had been placed on paid leave. This would spark massive outrage online, as people were furious, but this would also spark a debate, as according to some, the mere presence of a gun gives an officer license to go open season on someone simply answering their own front door. Others have blamed this on the whole defund the police campaign, leading to law enforcement hiring just anybody who's trigger happy. But hell, they've been doing that since the beginning of time. Now Roger had no criminal record, and there was no evidence that he was even involved in the alleged domestic disturbance that led to the deputy being called to the apartment complex in the first place. As a matter of fact, the only other being in Roger's apartment was his dog, Chloe, who was right by his side when he was gunned down and his family would get many inquiries from dog lovers across the nation concerned for Chloe's well-being. The Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office would release the deputy's body cam video to the public along with 911 calls and reports, but heavily redacted much of the important information in those reports. The agency also refused to speak any further on the deputy or whether or not the deputy had made any statement to investigators. The Sheriff's Office also denied claims that he responded to the wrong apartment and no arrests were made nor was any apology given. Mind you, this was the same sheriff's office who just five months earlier detained a man by the name of Marquise Jackson in the back of a cop car. And as the officer involved walked around the vehicle, an acorn would fall from the tree onto his cop car. Thinking he was somehow being shot by the detained unarmed suspect in the vehicle, both he and his partner fired rounds into the squad car. Thankfully, Marquise was uninjured, but suffered PTSD, and the officer ended up resigning. But in this case, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement would launch their own investigation into the deputy. But since it's currently ongoing, they won't comment until it's complete. In the meantime, Roger's family and community would rally in his honor and hold a few press conferences to discuss their frustration. They hired civil rights attorney Ben Crump to help aid them in their quest for answers. The Fortson was the best America had to offer. He was a patriot. He was a U.S. Airman, Special Ops. I mean, he was fighting for our way of life. He was fighting for everybody. He was fighting for everybody. 
He graduated from high school in Atlanta, Georgia. He enlisted. He had dreams of being a pilot. He had always wanted to serve in the United States Air Force. And he was living his dream. And by doing so, he was going to make it better for his mother and his siblings and his family so they could have a better chance at the American dream. No, I didn't think I would be bearing him. I figured he'd be bearing me. And I just, but I, I felt like that all my life, though. You know, the way I was living my life, but I'm just, I just can't believe it. There will not be a stain on his name. He will not be put to rest in darkness because he was light. Fix his reputation, tell the truth, and give my child justice. Give him justice. Roger's funeral would be held on May 17th at the New Birth Missionary Baptist Church and was attended by hundreds, not just friends, family, and faculty from his high school, but so many airmen were present to pay their respects that their presence was described as a sea of Air Force Blue. And Roger's funeral would be live streamed across different airfields throughout the U.S. as they mourn the loss of one of their fellow airmen. Reverend Jamal Bryant said it best during the funeral that Roger was better to America than America was to Roger. Another memorial service for Roger also took place days later at a hangar on Hurlburt Field where officials presented his family with the Air and Space Commendation Medal an award given only to airmen who have distinguished themselves by meritorious achievement and service. But the officer who fired his weapon didn't see a decorated airman in Roger. No, the initial caller's description of a not-so-kind, domestically violent man slapping a woman around likely affected the cop's perception of whoever was going to be on the other side of that door in Unit 1401. And after seeing a melanated individual with a weapon in hand, all he saw was a criminal needing to be eradicated from the earth. And some local authorities harped on Roger holding a weapon when he answered the door as justification for the shooting, initially calling it a clear-cut case of self-defense for a deputy confronted with a split-second life-or-death decision. And for 27 days after the murder, authorities would conveniently withhold the identity of the officer involved while they conducted their investigation, as they were more concerned with his safety and protection in the meantime. It is worth noting that many officers of all races have expressed that they have been trained to be more wary and aggressive when dealing with minorities. And in the present day, we almost have to train civilians how to handle interactions with the police force. Go figure. But in a report dated May 30th, 2024, and released the next day, the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Department would reveal the identity of the officer as Deputy Eddie Duran and announce that he was officially terminated as their investigation found that Roger did not physically resist him in any way. And the investigation concluded that Roger did not point the gun in the former deputy's direction. Well, duh. The report released also included testimonies from the witnesses who claimed to have heard a man and a woman arguing nonstop in Unit 1401. One of the witnesses says she didn't know Roger personally, but she knew that he was an airman because he accidentally walked up to her front door thinking it was his apartment and she caught him on her ring camera. He was in uniform at that time. She says she believed that Roger was in a relationship because she had heard a female voice coming from his apartment and that they had been very loud at times in the past, but that it was mostly banter back and forth. Nothing like what she heard on May 3rd, which prompted her to call the cops because it had never been that bad. She said, I couldn't hear anyone back, but I just assumed that it was an argument because he was so loud. She could hear the sounds through an air vent in her bedroom. If you stand right there near the vent, you can hear everything, and I just so happened to be on my bed while that was going on so I could hear. She said she did not hear the voice of who Roger was speaking to on May 3rd, but assumed it was the same person from previous arguments, and that she heard him yelling, I'm sick of you lying to my face, and you're an effing liar, which indicated to her that there was likely confrontation going on, and that when she heard really loud footsteps and constant scuffling, she was like, okay, something's going on. Somebody's moving something, or I don't know if they're bumping into each other, just passing, or something like that. It was like something's going on, but since he was yelling, I was like, okay, something is wrong. Another witness reported hearing a child in the apartment in the past, and so that made her concern for the child's welfare. When asked how she knew it was a child, she said, you can hear the laughing and the little baby footsteps. When asked if she was sure that a child had been in the apartment at times over the last six months, and that she was not mistaking the dog for a child, she said, for sure, and that she had never seen a dog, 
but she acknowledged that the footsteps may have been from a dog, but then added, but you can hear because like, mommy that, and I can hear her crying sometimes, mommy this, mommy that. Apparently, these statements are what prompted the leasing office to contact police and file the report. Also, according to the report, when Deputy Duran got the news about a domestic disturbance, he stated that he approached the situation like a verbal altercation that had turned into a physical one and that he had to act fast before it escalated any further. And as he came up to Roger's apartment, he put his ear to the door and didn't hear any arguing. But he said that when he banged on the door and announced himself as Sheriff's Department, that he heard something faint along the lines of, it's the effing police. So he felt like whoever was on the other side knew full well that he was the Popos. When Deputy Duran was asked about his impression when he looked at Roger after the door had opened, he said, when I saw his eyes, uh, I saw aggression. I saw, you know, um, obviously again, interacting with individuals in these type of situations, you're dealing with people who are most likely and during the worst time of their life at that particular moment. Um, so I see aggression, anger. Um, when asked what made him believe that he saw aggression, he explained, when I looked at him and he made eye contact or I made eye contact with him, it was a stare that was fixated 100% on me, um, which as I'm looking at him, it wasn't eyebrows raised, hey, what's going on, inquisitive, why are you here? It was a stare, not so much a, like I said, inquisitive look. Um, so that showed me that there was obviously a little bit of discontent for me knocking on the door. He then said that Roger didn't follow his command, saying, I see the individual open the door and as he's moving in, I tell him to step back. And then, um, you know, as he's opening the door, he's starting to move forward. He makes a slight step forward with his left leg. So initially when I see the firearm, his hand and the elbow are slightly canted, meaning not straight down. It is in a manner so that his arm is slightly up. So when I see the gun, I immediately see the grip that he has on it, which is a standard pistol grip. And after describing the type of weapon that he saw, he said, so then immediately at that point, once I gauge from what I can understand his intent, what I can understand as far as him knowing that I was already there from what I know and that I'm telling him to step back and there was a slight step forward, uh, I immediately thought I'm stuck in this area and I'm about to get shot. When asked if he considered moving out of the way, he explained the limitations presented by his positioning on the breezeway, which in his mind made moving impractical. When asked if he considered telling Roger to drop the weapon or issue any other commands, he answered, uh, based on everything that I had taken into account, I felt 100% that action was going to be my best course as opposed to reaction. Based on how close we were, the proximity, obviously there was maybe three to four feet of reactionary gap, um, I immediately felt that I was at a disadvantage considering that he had his gun readily available for use um, and mine was still holstered. So at that point, uh, again, action was going to be better than reaction to prevent any kind of uh, great bodily harm or death to myself. Deputy Duran was asked how many times he thought he shot. He said, about five times. And that after he had stopped firing, he was reaching for his radio to call that shots were fired, but he saw that Roger was still moving, so he went back into a two-handed position. When asked why he gave commands to Roger to drop the gun once he was already laying on the ground, Duran said that at that point he could not see Roger's hands or the weapon. However, Roger's girlfriend denied claims of any altercation or accusations of a couple in a heated argument and said that Roger was playing video games while on FaceTime with her when the knocks came in and that when he heard the first knock at the door, he asked, who is it? And got no response. He then told her, I don't know who that could be because nobody comes up to my house and that as a result, he wasn't going to answer the door. Then there was another knock. So Roger went to the peephole but didn't see no one. So he went back to the living room. She said that neither of them heard anyone say sheriff's office, but then there was a third loud bang and it was significantly more aggressive. Then he put the phone down and said, I'm going to go grab my gun because I don't know who that is. And as he neared the door, he said, who the F is it? Very loudly. Then the door opens and shots ring out. Now, ironically enough, after Roger's unfortunate demise, there would be another domestic disturbance call to law enforcement from the same apartment complex. See, that part didn't stop. So were the witnesses mistaken? Were the heated arguments coming in through old girl's vent coming from a different unit entirely? Or perhaps Roger had gotten loud out of his passion for the video game he was playing. I mean, you know how gamers are during an intense play. Or did the witnesses exaggerate what they heard? Or simply make the whole thing up? We may never truly know, but one thing's for certain. In all of these cases, there was no reason for things to end the way they did. 
Okaloosa County Sheriff Eric Aiden released the following statement on May 31st. This tragic incident should have never occurred. The objective facts do not support the use of deadly force as an appropriate response to Roger's actions. Roger did not commit any crime. By all accounts, he was an exceptional airman and individual. As for whether or not Duran will face any charges, that'll be up to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement once their investigation wraps. At the end of the day, what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. Roger did nothing wrong by answering the door with his legally owned firearm down by his side. And had he invoked Florida's ever so popular stand your ground law and returned fire upon somebody holding a weapon to his face at his residence, legally he would have been well within his rights to do so. Being an innocent law-abiding citizen and answering your front door only to be gunned down is a cold-blooded execution no matter which way you spin it. And in any other case, the perpetrator would face justice immediately if they were caught on camera and apprehended. But because it was an officer doing this, there is a probability that he may walk. But the hundreds of thousands of Rogers supporters are actively fighting to ensure that doesn't happen. Rest in peace to Roger Fortson. You served your country diligently, protecting its citizens from enemy threats both foreign and domestic, only to have your life taken by someone sworn to protect and serve you just the same, and for no reason at all. Your memory will live on forever in the hearts of the lives you touched, and your death will serve as a dark reminder of the war on minorities at the hands of unruly law enforcement officers who abuse their power. This is Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like and y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so. And I'ma catch y'all in the next video.